Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I wanted to talk about another Apache project that I've been hearing a lot about recently, and that is Apache Flink. Um, and so what Apache Flink is, is it is basically your one-stop shop for everything data streaming. And because this was a project that was started in the Technical University of Berlin in 2009, they have to use terms like stateful commutations over data streams to refer to it. Um, but really it is just stream processing. Um, so real-time streaming engine um, and Apache Flink is really kind of a one-stop shop Swiss Army knife for all of everything data streams. Um, so it again, you know, was started as an academic project to really just design a way to process continuous streams really, really efficiently. Um, and so sim similar to how Airflow, you know, manages your data pipelines, Apache Flink can manage, uh, you know, a symphony of data um, and turn chaos into uh, a harmony. And what really makes Flink stand out uh, is its focus on stream processing. So a lot of services companies that claim to be doing streaming are really just doing really fast batching of their data. Um, and so batch processing is where you know you process a bounded data stream. And even if you're just processing, you know, hey, a second's worth of data, that's still a batch. That's a batch of a second's worth of data. And especially when you're really dealing with really, really high volume data streams where you could be processing, you know, hundreds of thousands of data points within that one second, maybe you're processing a data point a millisecond, you batching, it almost becomes uh, improbable, you know, it, it becomes much harder to actually do. Uh, versus streaming is truly stream processing with the patch of like is tru truly, you know, as that data arrives, it goes through a series of operations. And you can kind of see the diff the reason why I brought the documentation up on screen is you can kind of see it here. So imagine, you know, you have start a stream, it's segmented into now and the past, you have these bounded streams and these data, this data chunk is being loaded. It's going through some set of processes versus here with Apache Flink, you can kind of see some example code here where you have your source that's coming in, this case from a, a Kafka consumer. Um, and then immediately once that data is brought in from that Kafka stream, it's processed, it goes through some transformations, then is added to you know, your sync operator. And that's gonna be something like uploading into a database, um, uploading it into a, you know another application, whatever. And you can see here kind of an expanded workflow where you have, you know, Flink is able to act as the engine for many, many different sources. And it can be bounded, you know, it can still process a set of data because it is, again, you know, imagine that set of data, each point is just going through that set of data processes that Flink has defined. defined. Um, and that is why it, and even though, you know, state, uh, Flink says, hey, we're stateful, everything has to have a state, doesn't necessarily be true. Um, so, that's why I was a little bit confused when you know it said, "Hey, stateful computations over data streams," because it doesn't actually all to be stateful. Um, and what that means, stateless means, hey, no matter what happens, you know, if, if I send a request, don't get a response, whatever, I won't, you know, trigger an action. If stateful is saying, "Hey, if I don't get a response when I trigger that API point, keep triggering it, keep triggering it until I get a response and I'm able to run it." Um, so you can think of it kind of like a pinging versus just a set and forget. Um, and so here, you know, you can see you can Flink can manage every different upstream data source, and it can manage putting those into any of your downstream data applications. Um, and so really adaptable tool. Uh, it can, you know, consume things like logs, but also things, you know, just really customer data, point of sale, um, just a wide variety of different options for you to implement it. And so I also just to kind of, you know, bring aside the documentation and talk a little more high level about, you know, the benefits that this approach provides. Um, and in doing so, kind of compare it from, you know, an event driven application like Patch Flink to a traditional, you know, transactional. Um, number one, real time processing, as I think I've highlighted ad nauseum now, it is really, really great for data streams um, where you can say, hey, you know, I, there's no lag time between when data arrives and when it's processed, um, unlike batching. So for financial services, anything where you need really, really fast millisecond up to date data, super useful. Um, additionally, fault tolerance and consistency. Um, so Flink has a distributed lightweight snapshot mechanism. Um, so Flink will actually preserve periodically what you're doing within Flink by taking snapshots. Um, and it will say, hey, you know, this is what's currently going on with this job. These are the transformations that are running. This is the type of data that's moving through it. Um, and it will take all that information about your processing semantics. So you have accurate results, even if, you know, your data source goes down, um, it can go back and process, hey, you know, any data that was missed during that period. Um, and additionally, Flink, um, because 
it is open source, can be installed on distributed computing, can scale this independently. Um, and if I go actually into just their documentation quickly to kind of uh, show you what I'm talking about here. So it is designed to run in any common cluster computer environment. So you can slap this on a Kubernetes cluster, run it here and scale it to your heart's content, just like you can with Airflow. So just want to highlight that, that this is a truly scalable, you know, just like Spark, just like any streaming solution. If you're going to be able to process data at that level of scale, you know, if you need to process thousands of data points in parallel, you're going to need to have the compute to back it up. And so Flink is able to scale to meet the requirements of, you know, petabyte uh, scale uh, sizes of information. So really great to know that it's there, right? <laughs> um, and so all these powers kind of give it the ability to adapt to many, many different use cases. You know, it can be you know, something like complex, really fat, high speed uh, finance data, um, or it could be just, you know, hey, I want a easier way to process my point of sale data where I don't have to batch it. Uh, I don't have any risk of, you know, a batch not running and I lose that data. I want every time someone makes an order for that data to get processed right then and now, and I want to make sure that order gets shipped out right on time. And so now you kind of, you know, heard about, hey, why Flink is useful, what, what it's used for. I also want to talk quickly just about, you know, some of the biggest use cases that it's been used for. Um, and hopefully Flink has these actually on their webpage, um, but I did a little more digging. And so number one, uh, Alibaba. So Flink, uh, they use it to actually optimize all their search rankings, personalized recommendations for their massive user base, processing millions of events per second. Um, and then what that means is that, hey, Right when someone makes a search request, Alibaba uses that data, processes it through Flink, uses it to generate search responses that are optimized for that specific user. Um, and so the scale of data points, you need to do that just for like, you know, 30 users. But for someone like Alibaba, uh, you know, they need the ability to process millions of data points per second. And that's where Flink is able to come in handy. Uh, additionally, you also have uh, Uber and Netflix who actually aren't listed on here. Oh, yeah, there we go. So here's Uber. Um, and so Uber they actually analyze uh, t constant streams of data from their drivers, from price fees, from customers uh, to and use Flink to actually power uh, their dynamic pricing models. So Flink is able to take all the information about what's going on you know, in New York City and any big city and feed it into an Uber pricing model that gouges you out just enough that you're willing to pay, uh, but also makes you feel just a little bit bad about yourself for taking an Uber because of how freaking expensive it is these days. Um, I don't know if any of you live in New York City, but it is excruciatingly painful. And then of course, you know, Lyft is doing uh, similar things, but for machine learning. Um, and then Netflix again, really any company that needs to do a lot of search where you need to recommend flink is you know a really good tool for that so that's what people are using it for um, and so now they've kind of gone through you know hey what flink is useful for how to use it now let's go into actually how to get started and install it on your local machine uh, so now i will kick it over vs code and show you how to do that so Flink, it, you need to have Java number one, 11 to install, um, and you can go through a really long, complicated install process, or you could just use a Docker image. Uh, so we're going to go with the Docker image approach, and I'll drop the link in the description below for how you can get that. Um, but just going to make it a lot easier, I think, for us to actually uh, be able to use Flink. Um, and so all you'll need to do here is just Docker pull Flink. And then let it run. So I'll pause it real quick. Although it seems like the Docker image is a little bit busted to use and the instructions on their documentation actually don't cover it. So instead, we're going to do it ourselves. Um, so we are going to CD a new desktop, data guy, and then make directory, actually flink, CD. And then what we'll do um, is download the latest binary release of Flink. So here, tar, awesome. So we're going back to Docker um, because yeah, it's like binary. It's just not a uh, not loving the local development experience of Flink. Someone should really come up with a managed solution for these. So we're going to set Flink properties, and we're going to set a Docker network create Flink network, um, and then we're going to run a job manager. Um, to with our Flink properties. And hopefully this runs properly. Boom, boom, boom. Amazing. And then I'm going to pause it again for this to finish running. And because I'm stupid, I did realize uh, this is going to run in the background. So then after you've run your job manager, you're also going to start another terminal manner terminal and run your task manager. 
the parallels with airflow at this are just endless. Uh, maybe I'm just addicted to airflow, but it really is uh, quite funny to me. Um, so now I don't know if this is going to work or not, but what should happen? There we go. I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Localhost 81. Oh, wow. Okay. It worked. This is awesome. So if we go here, you can see you have at localhost 8081, your Apache Flank dashboard. Um, so here you can see uh, I have just, if I go to localhost 8081, um, it's actually not that hard to start running. Um, I was wrong. Just make sure you use that Docker image. Um, so here, running jobs, completed jobs, you can see here, um, if I want to submit a new job, uploading jars, and getting into actually using Flink might be a little bit above my pay grade for this video. But if you guys like this, if you're interested in seeing more content on Apache Flink, please let me know, and the data guy will oblige. I'll make you some more content on how to use this and uh, some actual functional tutorials. Um, so hope you enjoyed this video. Have a good rest of your day. Data guy out. Peace.